So one of the big problems of learning a musical instrument is simply the amount of repetition, the amount of, of uh, uh, practice you need time and time with the same song in order to get the muscle memory, the motor memory of that song, right? But what if I told you I could teach you the motor memory for Mozart's Turkish March without, con uh, without conscious attention? What if I told you that in the time you spent this morning, you could already have learned a concerto without paying attention to it? Well, that's what we're doing with something called passive haptic learning. This is a glove. We call this the mobile music touch. And what it does is uh, you, you pull out the song you want to learn, you put it on your cell phone, they wear your Bluetooth earphones, and as each note is played, it taps the note, uh, it taps the finger that belongs to each note. So if I'm doing something like Beethoven's Ode to Joy, it'll just do the first stanza again and again, and as each note is played, it taps that finger that belongs to that note. And it turns out that in 20 minutes, you'll learn the first stanza, the first phrase of music, and another 20, the second phrase. And it turns out that in about an hour or so, you can actually start doing um, relatively complicated pieces. Now, how this works, like I said, is these little, little pancake motors, little vibration motors above each knuckle. And the reason why we made it this way is so that uh, we could actually keep the fingers clear. Now, this is an old version of the glove, but when people wear these things around, we generally try to keep with biker gloves or, or motorcycle gloves so that the fingers remain clear and you have good grip. Now, this is something that sounds crazy, uh, but we've actually done this, about eight different studies on this, and it tends to work very well. As a matter of fact, it works so well that we decided to take it to CNN and show it live. Never do a live demo on CNN. <laughs> But uh, we were brave or stupid or a combination thereof. And uh, this is what resulted. Now, again, this is a glove that just sits there and taps the fingers. And what I didn't tell you is that you don't even have to listen to the music. All you have to do is have that tapping. So I'm going to introduce you to Chad Myers. Chad Myers is the meteorologist on CNN. He has absolutely no musical ability. I know because we tested him. <laughs> and he was, you know, we arrived about an hour early. And for about 45 minutes, we put the glove on. We gave him the simplest song we had because it's a live demo. It's Beethoven's Ode to Joy. It's a, it's a pentatonic scale. It's, it's a pretty simple song. And we just put the glove on him, and he's tracking the hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico at that time. And this thing's just tapping his fingers over and over again. And after, uh, after a while, we brought him out live on camera, and he had his debut as a pianist. Now, as he plays, I want you to see a couple things. First of all, the stage fright that overcomes him as he doesn't really think it's going to work. Then second of all, the realization that he knows the song he's playing because he's never heard it before until he starts playing it. And, he, and you'll see he gets better and better the more he plays, right? But he's never touched the piano before uh, with this song. Now, what's interesting there is that he doesn't even know how to describe what is going on, right? <laughs> he has no clue. Of, he doesn't even know what happened to him. And I had a, a, a professor from um, Portland, who's actually now working for Intel, come in and say, I don't believe you. I said, great. Um, you shouldn't believe me. Let's use you as a test subject. And so um, we gave him, a, a, I can't remember which song we gave him, maybe it was uh, Amazing Grace or something. But it, was still, it was still the, the single hand, single note melody. We're, we're trying not to give people the full you know, concerto stuff the first time. But we gave him the, the simple thing and we got talking about other things. And I completely forgot he had the glove on. And little did I know that my student had accidentally left the entire Beethoven's Ode to Joy on the thing. 
And so as we got distracted and started talking about stuff uh, for about an hour and a half, um, he finally says, well, can we try it? I'm like, try what? The glove. Oh, right, right. Give me the glove. Right? Pull it off. And he sits down. And you can tell these type A personalities, right? He's focusing very hard on trying to get this out because he wants this to work. And he can't do it. He can't get the notes out of his fingers. And I'm like, okay, what's going on is you're concentrating too hard. What we're going to do is we're going to have a more, another discussion. And I'm going to distract you. And when I say go, you're going to start playing. But you're going to focus on, this, on the discussion because you perform best in the way in which you learned. You learned with almost no attention to it, so you're going to play with almost no attention to it. So you start talking about things. I start talking about wearable computers for working dogs, which got him focused on me, right? And once I knew I got his attention, his intellectual curiosity, I said, go. And he started playing, and I immediately gave him a sound bite to keep his focus on me and not the glove, or not the, his hand. And he starts playing perfectly, right? Beautifully, perfectly, the entire sequence Ode to Joy, which I hadn't realized was there. And you know, as he's going on, you can see his jaw start hitting the floor, and I'm starting to get curious. I'm like, how, how do you know the whole thing? You're just messing with me, right? That song should be the first stanza. How do you know the rest of it, right? You play piano. I was like, oh, I played piano when I was young, but so how do you know the rest of it? I'm like, here, let me go find the glove. And it turned out that the hour and a half with the whole song was sufficient to do the whole song. It was the first time and only time we actually had somebody do the entire uh, learning in one session. And so I kind of know how, how long it takes to do Beethoven's Over Joy now. Now, if you do something more complex, like uh, Mozart's Turkish March, it's, uh, each chord has to be done one note at a time. So if you do a chord like this, you have to stimulate the thumb, the middle finger, and the, the pinky uh, in sequence. And so you have to spread out the learning a little bit more. So, so a complex song takes longer to learn. But again, you're learning it. You're learning the muscle memory without conscious attention. Uh, when we submit a paper on this to one of our first conferences, one of the uh, anonymous reviewers said something brilliant, which is, this would be great for all those musicians with repetitive stress injuries. They can learn the motor memory and then go focus on the musicianship without irritating themselves unnecessarily. I'm like, smart. So we, showed that we, sh uh, we found this and we were like, well, what else can we do besides piano? Well, my student, uh, Caitlin Syme, who's done, done most of the research I'm going to tell, talk to you about now, uh, told me that there's this crisis in teaching Braille uh, to people who are blind. About 40%, only 40% of students in the school system actually know Braille, and Braille is directly related to job success and educational success later on in life. Matter of fact, in general, only 10% of the, uh, the population who's blind actually knows Braille. And that's a lot because the older adults lose their, their sight but never pick up Braille later on. But that relates to you know, the enjoyment of reading right, and the literacy. So for our kids, it really is Braille is equivalent to literacy. And so the problem is that there's very few teachers out there who teach Braille. Um, so the question is, can we actually teach Braille typing using passive haptic learning? So Braille, uh, unabridged Braille, is done with six fingers, these six fingers. And it's a relatively simple alphabet. It's keyed using this thing called a Perkins Brailler. And the finger is mapped to the pips, just like that. Right? So the top, the top pips, the middle pips, the bottom pips. Now there's a more complicated version of Braille which uses all eight fingers. But that's generally when you're doing things like ING as one, as one con uh, continuous thing. So what we're trying to do is get students over the hump of learning Braille at first. And the question is, um, can we do this passively? So this is our setup. Um, this is actually the, after the test. So we have two gloves this time for, for both hands. And the question was, does this work with a linguistics task? Music is kind of lower level in the brain. And so we kind of, while we were surprised it worked, um, uh, uh, it, it, it kind of made sense after a while. But the problem is language is much higher in the brain. Can we actually teach people a language system uh, ha passively? And so what's happening here is you have your earbuds on, and you're hearing the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, which has all the letters of the alphabet, and then the, and then T, and then you feel the vibrations indicate the chord for, for T. And then same, and then H, and the vibrations for that, and E, et cetera. And you do this uh, for each word in uh, tw uh, 16 sessions. And this is about uh, four hours total exposure. And we test uh, the students on the quick bomb funk drops over the lazy dog uh, each time 
after every, every 20 minutes. And as you can see, of course, when they only have T-H-E, they're missing you know, the 23 of the letters. But you can see how their learning rate collapses down to uh, zero error uh, later on in four hours. So three of our four subjects were actually typing perfectly. Now, I'm not saying they're typing fast, but I'm saying they know all the letters at the end of four hours. Compared to control as, 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 uh, subjects, they never got down to, to zero. And when I say control, I'm saying the only practice they get is during the actual test. We uh, have them uh, play the same video game these guys are playing, but uh, we don't give them the, the, the vibrations. Now, I should mention again, these folks are told not to pay attention to the vibrations on their fingers. They are told to get the best score they can on this video game. It turned out that our distraction tasks, you know, that we're, we're trying to make sure they're not paying attention, so we're giving these distraction tests. Turns out this video game was the best thing we found. It's called Fritz. We tried graduate uh, uh, research uh, exams. We tried scavenger hunts. We tried memory games. The thing that's most sensitive to figure out when they're paying attention to the, video, to, to the, the distraction task or the vibration was this video game. And so these, these students had very, very sm little change in their scores and their abilities on the video game compared to uh, uh, when they had the vibration when they didn't. So this is great. We've now shown that we can actually teach how to type Braille without, uh, without attention. What was surprising is that they also learned how to read Braille. So if I showed them one of these, uh, one of these characters like G there, they would sit there and think, Oh, how would I type that? Well, it'd be these two fingers. Oh, it's G, right? So they not only learned how to type it, they learned how to read it visually, and to, my, to our surprise, they actually learned how to read it textual, uh, uh, tactically as well. So presenting something on the fingers for typing also taught them how to read visually and uh, uh, read tactically. That was quite a surprise. So then we started saying, what else can we teach? And it turns out we can also teach Morse code. Right? And how we did that, we used, we used Google Glass. Google Glass has a little uh, vibrating uh, motor here. And that, what that does is it taps on the side of your head. And it, normally it does a sound. So this thing's a bone conducting transducer. When sound comes in, it uses your skull as a speaker, goes through your skull, goes to your cochlea, and you hear the sound. Here, we're hitting with 15 hertz, so it feels like a tap. And so we just kept on doing the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, each letter, and we tap the side of their head at the same time. Again, in four hours, they learned how to do it. Now we're actually working on QWERTY, and we're also working on stenotype. Can we actually teach people how to do, court, how to do courtroom reporting at 300 words per minute? Uh, if you can do that, you can get a $100,000 a year job um, with only a high school diploma. The big problem here is that 85% of st uh, stenotype students drop out because it's so hard to learn. Can we actually teach them passively? Now, at a GVU showcase not too long ago, we had a, um, a uh, visitor by the name of Debbie Bacchus, who came by, and this is why I love doing the GVU showcase. Um, uh, we never know who's going to come by and what sort of collaborations we're going to get. And Debbie said, can I try that for my patients with tetraplegia? And I couldn't understand what she meant at first. She said, no, that tetraplegia does not mean that, all, uh, that they're paralyzed. It means just all four limbs are affected. So I suspect that for my patients with partial spinal cord breaks, where they're still getting some signal to their brain, the tapping on their hands will actually recruit more and more neurons to help explain the sensations they're feeling. I betcha, if we give this to them for, for, uh, for a while, they'll actually get better sensation dexterity. And it turns out she's right. This is Rick, he's one of our, our, our participants. You'll see him again in a second. He um, uh, tried our, our system. Uh, we had active and passive users. Uh, so this is our control group was just people getting three 30-minute um, piano lessons a week. And this is the piano lesson is just the piano lighting up its keys and people trying to repeat it. Um, compared to the three 30-minute uh, uh, active lessons and then five two-hour sessions of just wearing the glove at home, doing whatever they're doing, whether it's like email or watching TV or whatever else, they just had the vibration on for 10 hours a week. And so what we saw is between control and um, experimental is uh, a significant improvement in experimental. So on the left-hand side, uh, the, is the, uh, the control group, and red means their, their sensation actually deteriorated, green means it improved. And so you can see it's kind of random on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, every single area we, we, we touched, every single area we tested um, for sensation significantly improved. 
And so we had patients uh, come in where they could cut themselves and not realize they were bleeding and go out actually having some sensation in their, some protective sensation in, the, in their hands. We had people progress from diminished sensation to actual what would be considered normal sensation uh, in the study. And the interesting thing is the mo worse people were when they started, the better the result was. Now, this was really exciting to us um, because some people came in and could like type with one finger. They could go and went out being able to type with four. Let me actually show you a video of this. This is, uh, we're going to show one, one, uh, uh, one uh, hand here. This is again Rick learning one of our songs. We're actually practicing one of our songs. You can see he's, start, he's starting to get some articulation there of his fingers. So what was excellent about this whole thing is that we had some people came in not being able to dress themselves. They went out being able to button their own buttons. We had one guy who came in and said, hi, can you actually do happy birthday for me? My grandson's birthday is on Saturday. Can you hook me up? And we're like, mm, I'll see why not. And so this 80-year-old who his grandson always thought of him as old crippled grandpa actually played him happy birthday on the piano by the end. So for him, it wasn't about the rehab, it was about learning a new skill. But that same guy said, if I can get such an improvement on my hands, maybe I can work on other things as well. So he started actually going to the gym every day and say, if it's just a sheer, if it's just sheer determination, if it's just sheer amount of exposure, maybe I can improve my walking. The last session he walked into our study. Now we had nothing to do with that. We just showed him that you know, with enough stimulation, with enough experience, you actually can do significant, significant amount of improvement. It's just a heck of a lot of exposure. And what we're doing is we're giving people the ability to get that exposure, get that training, get that relearning without um, active attention, without much effort. Now, one of the things that's also very exciting about this whole system is that these folks were one year post-injury. That's important because one year post-injury, most insurance companies stop covering rehab. Because what they think is that rehab, you kind of get asymptotic. You get no longer get an improvement. And what this study showed is that even a year post-injury, where people think that partial spinal cord, partial spinal cord injury is not going to get better, we can still get a significant jump. And we can do it cheaply without you going to the lab. We have a device here we can send home with you. It's no longer $100 an hour for rehab. It's a $100 device. Right? And you take it home with you, and you keep on getting this improvement. So now, the big elephant in the room is stroke. We were talking with uh, Steve Wolf over at Emory, and he says that half of the people who have stroke have uh, a, a, limb, uh, a hand effect. Um, they can't do anything for them. Normally, the, uh, uh, what they do is they strap down the bad, the good hand, and they force them to use the good, good hand. They only can do that for half the patients, because you need some independent finger control. It doesn't matter how much, just some, and you're able to grip stuff. And they tie down the hand and force you to use this bad hand. But half the patients, 500,000 people a year in the US, don't have that independent finger sensation. So what we're doing now is saying, OK, for these people who are the worst of the worst of stroke, right, where they still have some sensation, some dexterity in the hand, can we actually put the glove on and get to the stage where we get independent finger motion? And the answer, maybe yes. We just finished our, uh, uh, our collection of our data last week. And we're actually seeing significant improvement in sensation and range of movement in these folks. People come in with their fingernails butting into their palms because they're so clenched. They go out being, starting to be able to do this. And so wish us luck. We'll see that. If we can, ha if we can do that, we'll have a significant uh, way to help people, uh, 500,000 people a year, who have this, uh, this, these problems that currently the current best solution is injecting them with Botox. Thank you very much. My name is Thad Starner. You'll see me over uh, here tonight uh, starting around 3.30 or so in the, the demo. My folks are people on the second floor. Go say hello to Caitlin and try the system out for yourself. Thank you much.